Welcome to See Things Differently, a podcast from Remix Summits in collaboration with our series partner, the UK Government and Time Out. I'm your host, Peter Tullen, and your guide to the future of the creative economy. This podcast is for creatives who want to be creative entrepreneurs. Over the last few years, thousands of delegates to Remix events have gathered in leading creative cities such as London, New York, Sydney and Istanbul to hear from the visionaries behind emerging creative powerhouses such as Meow Wolf, Punch Drunk, Secret Cinema and Team Lab, alongside established names such as Glastonbury, Burning Man and MoMA. I believe we are in the age of the creator. And through See Things Differently, we have another platform to share the stories of the pioneers developing the creative content, products and experiences that are reshaping the economy. I also believe creative entrepreneurs could offer some of the answers to how we can build back better from the global pandemic. Finally, if you like what you hear, there are literally hundreds more talks from Remix events around the globe at remixsummits.com. And better still, many of them are free. So what's not to like? TikTok might only be five years old, but the short form video social networking service is a big deal these days with over 1 billion active users each month. TikTok is often associated with a younger demographic with Gen Z making up the biggest group of users. But the app is being used by more and more millennials who now make up the next largest user group. It's best known for its viral memes and lip sync songs, but the range of content these days is incredibly broad. There's an increasing amount of educational content. And this is where Mary McGillivray, aka the Iconoclast, fits in. She is what you might call an art TikTok superstar. An Australian currently based in the UK, Mary describes herself as a video essayist making art history accessible to the next generation. It turns out she's pretty good at it. Despite only starting on TikTok at the start of the pandemic, she has already amassed close to 400,000 followers and over 8 million likes. In her videos, she explores everything from individual works of art to different art movements. Her style is light-hearted, extremely witty and engaging, but crucially, she knows her stuff and has an academic background in the subject matter. Her success has seen her courted by multiple cultural institutions, from the big guys such as the NGV, uh, which is Australia's most visited cultural institution, to smaller players such as Coffs Harbour Regional Art Gallery. I've also had the pleasure of working with Mary and her partner in crime, Julian O'Shea, also a popular TikToker and YouTuber, as she is part of the Alchemy Initiative, a project Remix has co-developed with State Library Victoria to develop a series of innovative new in-person and digital experiences at one of the most visited libraries in the world. Her work with cultural institutions has also brought them exposure beyond the engagement on TikTok, with Mary being featured in everything from the Australian newspaper to the ABC. In this interview, she also delves into the entrepreneurial side of being a content creator. Welcome to the uh, the pod. It's great to have you on uh, See Things Differently. Look, for some of our listeners, uh, they're obviously going to be aware of TikTok, um, but they don't necessarily uh, you know, understand it. So I, I, I would love if you could just give us a quick intro to TikTok, why you think it's such an important platform for creating and sharing content. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, TikTok is the fastest growing social media platform uh, in the world. And I know that a lot of people think it's just for kids. It's just for silly dance videos, but there's actually a huge variety of content on the platform um, as, you know, as wide a variety of content as you might see on any other video sharing platform like YouTube, for example. Um, It's also uh, the favorite video sharing platform for people under the age of 34. So 50%, I think, is the latest statistic that 50% of uh, TikTok users are under the age of 34. um, And they're consuming huge quantities of TikTok content as well. They're not just casual viewers, but people spend hours Mm. on this app per day. 
Um, it's incredibly immediate. It's incredibly accessible. It's on your phone only, mainly. No one watches TikTok on the computer. So it's around people carrying it around in their pockets, which makes it, you know, quite embedded in a lot of um, people's lives. Uh, and I think it's a really powerful place to connect with people. Right. So absolutely huge audience, you know, billion plus people or something crazy like that. So um, clearly people should should be on it. And um, look, I'm interested in terms of, first of all, like what, what about your journey into this world? So you're, you, how did you end up on TikTok? That's a, it's an interesting story. My first foray into TikTok actually was uh, the sort of beginning of 2020, the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. Um, I, um, I'm a video editor by profession and um, I edited the world's first narrative series for TikTok. Uh, wow that a couple of my producer friends, um, very, very talented producers, Michelle Melke and Haley Adams produced. The show is written by Elise Adams. Um, it's called Love Songs. And it was kind of an experiment into um, how to do a narrative show for TikTok. And they got me in on it to just, to just edit, put it together at the end after they'd shot it. Um, and I hadn't really been on TikTok before. So I had to learn very quickly how to edit a show that was vertical in orientation, not landscape, and a show that had episodes that were under a minute long each, uh, cause that's of course the time limit or was the time limit on TikTok. Now it's three minutes. Um, but, uh, it's that was like, like my Twitter. Kind of, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like the tweets of the video world essentially. Um, yeah. Uh, basically I had to learn very quickly how TikTok worked, what the, what the kind of vibe of the platform was, how the sound function worked, how trends worked. Um, and that was my first foray into TikTok, but it wasn't until uh, halfway through 2020 in the middle of, of lockdown, COVID lockdown, that I decided to like make my own TikToks. Um, I was in a very sort of, um, you know, loose end of a state, I guess. Uh, it was meant to be, I had to delay my study plans for my master's because of COVID because I couldn't travel overseas. And um, my friends, my producer friends, again, encouraged me to make some TikToks about uh, art history and history and things that I was interested in. They said to me, like, you can edit, you know how video works, um, and you have some of the, like, specialist knowledge to communicate ideas to people. Um, why not put them together and stop moping on your couch every day? <laughs> so that's what I did. Well, and, and, and what was the response? So I guess you, you see the analytics and was it kind of what you expected or? Um, I didn't really know what I was doing at the start, to be honest. Um, I just sort of made a few videos and I think a couple of them really took off. That's the like interesting thing about TikTok is that uh, you can – very quickly go viral and the numbers that you get in terms of views, because the videos are so short, um, the numbers that you get in terms of views are just huge compared to other places. Uh, and I think like it's quite encouraging, like when you're just putting stuff out there and you're getting thousands of views pretty quickly, it makes you feel pretty like motivated to make more content. And so I did, um, I made a lot of content and I think within a couple of months I had my first video that hit a million views, which was a silly video about, um, about a hidden insult in the Sistine Chapel ceiling that Michelangelo painted in to, uh, to, um, offend the Pope. <laughs> Incredible. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that must've been an amazing feeling when you're getting, um, that, that kind of response in such a short space of time, really. I mean, your TikTok career is, I mean, it's, it's, it's only just started really, hasn't it? Yeah. It's been like, like 18 months kind of since I started doing TikTok. Um, I've reached 380,000 followers. Um, my, like my most successful video has almost 6 million views. It's yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of bonkers. And I think that's, that's actually a lot of people's experience with the platform is like, um, 
very sudden sort of success because it is a platform that re rewards you purely just for making stuff like whatever you make if you keep at it um and if you if you know kind of how the platform works and you respond to like what works and what doesn't work it's like it can be very very lucrative mm. now now see things differently look we we cover obviously the kind of cultural and the creative industries and i, I thought it was interesting obviously a lot of your um content has obviously kind of art and culture at its core could could you talk a little bit about the type of content that you make and what and why you decided you wanted to make that content was it like a gap in the in the market was it a kind of passion thing or a, uh, your background yeah so i i have a um a bachelor of arts in art history uh and i'm currently doing my masters that's kind of always been my like academic passion um, and there are, there were, there were already some people on TikTok making history content, a bit of art history content, and I found them very quickly because there weren't a lot of us. Um, <laughs> and I think I, I, I make videos that are, that are um, a mixture of fun kind of meme content uh, that people, you know, who know a little bit about history or art history um, can you know understand the jokes and share them with their friends and their you know with their nerdy friends, <laughs> and, and, but then I also make um, educational type content that's like you know quick explainers about an artist or an artwork. I do like short analysis, like mini video essays, short analysis of artworks. I make argument about um, about you know the state of um, of arts education. Um, I do get a bit political uh, on my on my page as well, um, and in general, I see my content as like art history outreach to Gen Z because I think that often education, like formal education, um, fails to get teenagers in particular really interested in history. Like it's it's considered one of the more boring areas, and you know, teachers and educators can only do so much to get kids thinking that it's cool. But if they come across something online by themselves, if they're just scrolling through TikTok and they happen to come across my videos on by chance uh, and they think, oh, that's really interesting, they'll feel like they discovered it on their own, I think. <laughs> then they might, so it might spark a bit more interest. Yeah, interesting. So, so do you, do you have a particular audience in mind when you're creating that content? Because it for, for me, it does feel like you're, you know, filling a bit of a gap. It's perhaps different to how I think about how perhaps certainly, you know, some cultural institutions might produce content in the in the digital space. So, yeah, who are you aiming it at? Generally, I'm aiming at um, teenagers and young adults. Um, in terms of an age range, although I do have, I know that I have a lot of um, older people following me. I have a lot of people mm. comment saying, I downloaded TikTok because my grandkid told me to do it and I love your content. So I do have a huge range of ages um, following me. But uh, in general, I, th I'm, I think about a teenage audience um, and I try and speak to them in sort of, you know, the tone and the language that they understand, which is, you know, the TikTok meme language. Like you've, you've got to sort of understand how the, um, how the culture on the app works to be successful, I think. Um, and I, I know that, um, I'm not reaching perhaps the mainstream TikTok audience very often, unless my videos go really viral. Um, but I am reaching like an already somewhat engaged, you know, uh, group of young people who are sort of critically thinking maybe a bit politically minded, maybe they're art students or history students, um, or they want to study those things at university. Um, later, uh, I get a lot of messages on Instagram from my followers asking me about what I did at uni and if they have, if I have any advice for them about their sort of course planning or career advice. Um, so there's a lot of young people out there who, who want that kind of guidance and look to people like me and other creators for that guidance.
Fascinating. And, and actually, that, that interaction with your audience is um, that's an interesting area to maybe explore a bit more. So are they also encouraging you to create certain types of content as well? Or is that very much that comes from you? Uh, yeah. How, how far does that interaction go? Um, I get a lot of requests for specific topics, actually, like mm. all the time. And a lot of the time I can't like can't I can't do them all, but I also get asked to talk about things that I don't feel like I have enough knowledge in, um, uh, personally. Um, like I, I, like I'm a medievalist and I get asked all the time to talk about some amazing, you know, contemporary artists or, you know, 20th century artists. And it's, 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 um, I love learning about, I learn so much from my followers because they put me on to interesting things that I never would have seen before. Um, so I get, yeah, I get topic requests a lot. Um, and in general, you know, TikTok is is this kind of platform that makes it very clear to you what's working and what isn't working. If a video flops, it flops and you know mm. it's quite obvious, like, what people engage with, what they like, what they share, um, and what they, what they comment on in a way that's more than just, like, I like this. But if people comment saying, I have thoughts on this, that, that's what excites me the most. Yeah. Okay. And it's so you're right. So you, so the flops are as evident as the, as the hits. And as a, do you, do you find there's a tension sometimes between, um, ch I guess, chasing the hits? Again, actually going back to maybe how a cultural institution would, would think about this, it wouldn't necessarily be the eyeballs that are, are driving them. And yeah, how do you think about that as a, as a, as a creator? Is, is the temptation just to churn out more of the things that are, are popular? Or do you deliberately say, actually, these are things that I want to talk about? Um, it's definitely a balance between the two. I think the like, um, the views and numbers can be like, a you know, a blessing and a curse in that, you know, the, the things that I've been able to do in my career because of the success of the numbers on TikTok um, is amazing. But at the same time, it does um, sometimes cloud your kind of vision about, you know, how successful you are. It makes you anxious about how well your videos are doing. Um, in terms of, you know, chasing the numbers or looking for numbers, I've always, you know, this, this goes after like something that one of my friends once said to me, um, one of my producer friends, she said, I don't want to make stuff that no one's ever going to see. Mm. I would rather make things that are more, um, more targeted to a popular audience. If it means that people are actually going to see it, I really want to think about that audience and speak in their language. And, you know, if it means being savvy about how the platform works in order to make successful TikTok content. Um, I'd, I'd rather, you know, compromise on that, uh, and get some sort of a message out there than, you know, um, restrict what I'm doing to being sort of purely intellectual and, mm. you know, and eschewing any kind of trend or any kind of, um, you know, trick to like make the video do well. I think, I think that um, I want my content to be seen and I want it to spark people to look into things further. I'm not expecting my content to be like, a you know, a full BBC documentary on anything. I don't expect my content to be like, you know, an academic article that is, um, that is, you know, peer reviewed. It's not, that's not what I'm there for. I'm there to, mm. to you know, spark people's curiosity. Yeah, interesting. So, so like you going back to what you said, said earlier, where obviously you've got a particular specialism academically, but going back to, I think something you, you, you're, you're elaborating on, which is, look, you're a great storyteller. Um, you know, your, your content, it, it's very, it's very witty, it's very informative. Um, and I'm wondering how much, um, is there a temptation? I think personally, I think this is this is a good thing to actually start covering other historical subjects as well, because often the way to get people interested in something obviously is is the storytelling format, the approach, um, and obviously if you can feel comfortable that the content you're sharing is obviously of a, of a standard that you're you're happy that it's accurate and everything else. Would it not be tempting to to look at a whole other you know parts of history? You know, because it, it could obviously you know people like to consume it for you. I guess is what I'm saying. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think like, 
like I, you know, when I started on, on TikTok, I was making the most bizarrely niche content that was purely my interests, which was very specific to sort of late medieval, um, European history. And I thought that was broad enough, but obviously I was wrong. And I, I broadened it quite, quite a lot after that and, um, ended up sort of just talking about art history in general. Mm. Um, but, um, since, since, um, since beginning, especially since working with, uh, some museums and cultural institutions, um, in Australia, uh, I've had really cool opportunities to make content about things that I would not have chosen myself necessarily. Um, for example, collaboration, collaborating with, um, the Coffs Harbour Regional Art Gallery, I got to make a 10 part series about artworks in the National Still Life Award exhibition, mm. which they host every year. Um, and these are all contemporary artworks that, you know, I, I rarely talk about contemporary art of off my own, you know, off my own bat because it is slightly outside of my comfort zone. Um, but because I got to work with this art gallery and I collaborated with one of the curators on writing the scripts, we selected the artworks that I had, you know, I had a way to tell a story about them, often connecting them to the history of the genre mm. of still life painting. Um, and was able to make, yeah, like really successful 10 part series about topics that I, I wouldn't have chosen myself in the first place. And that's like the really cool thing about doing collaborations is that they push me out of my comfort zone, but then they also achieve really cool results for the people that I collaborate with. Great. Well, look, perhaps we could dive into your collaborations in, in a bit more detail, because I, I found it fascinating that you're, you know, as you say, you're now working with a number of cultural organisations from, you know, smaller regional, um, you know, museums and galleries that you mentioned, such as the Coffs Harbour Regional Gallery to, you know, really large, you know, metropolitan organisations such as the um, State Library of Victoria. Could you talk a bit more about that experience and perhaps cover some of the impact of, of your work? Yeah, sure. Um, the first collaboration I did was with the Mornington Peninsula Regional Art Gallery, um, and they just got in contact with me out of the blue and, um, and said, oh, do you want to come and make some TikTok content for us? And I said, sure. All right. So I um, went down to, to Mornington um, and made, uh, I sort of did it over a couple of months, like went down and made a few batches of content, just like exploring their collection um, and, um, and yeah, discussing some of their exhibitions and artworks on display and things, things that they had sort of squirreled away in their collection that didn't sort of get to get out very often. Um, and, um, and they posted them on their own TikTok account. Um, and it was like a really, really great experience because they had a lot of trust in me. Um, and, uh, it was very kind of collaborative and like on site and kind of we got to improvise a lot actually, uh, in what we were making. Do you think cultural organizations should really be spending time, say building their own TikTok accounts? Um, it'd be interesting to hear yeah. a little bit about, um, you know, I know you've got, you've got knowledge of, of where that's happening, um, around the world, or do you think they'd be better spending their time, you know, focusing on working with a, a creator such as yourself, or is it a bit of both? So yeah, the interesting thing with Mornington was that they posted everything on their own account. Um, and some of the videos did really well, others, you know, okay, but not fantastic. Um, whereas other collaborations that I've done, uh, have been far more successful views wise because I've posted the content on my own account. And I think it's like a really interesting question, uh, whether museums and cultural organizations, art galleries, heritage sites, whether they should, you know, sort of jump into the deep end with their own TikTok accounts or whether they should. Uh, look to creators, existing creators like me. And there are a lot of us out there. There's, it's not just me. <laughs> There's a lot of us out there uh, who already have spent the time building an audience and building a relationship with their audience. Um, and to collaborate in, in, um, 
in the the way of the uh, quote unquote influencer economy, as they call it these days. I don't think I don't see myself as a traditional influencer type, but um, but there's a lot of uh, I think power in understanding how brands collaborate with influencers in the same way museums and cultural organizations uh, can also uh, collaborate with the influences of, of, uh, of history or art history or, you know, culture uh, online. So, for example, with, um, with Coffs Harbour, my series for them on the Still Life uh, Award, one of the videos reached a million views uh, in about mm. a week and a half which was just a you know huge success and they couldn't believe it uh, the artist was absolutely blown away he was like i'm just an you know australian artist i had no idea my art would ever be seen by that many people on a platform like tiktok um i mean that must have been pro- presumably the single best piece of marketing they've ever done in their history i can't imagine they've had too many <laughs> things that have, have hit a million people so it's extraordinary yeah exactly and i think the other thing that was really successful about coffs harbor was that um uh, the curator Chloe Waters that I worked with didn't see it as an exercise in marketing. She saw it as an exercise in outreach. Um, she wanted uh, she wanted to just share the artwork with more people and share the story of the, the, the prize and the exhibition for the prize with more people. I think um, the biggest trap that cultural institutions can fall into with TikTok is seeing it as a marketing exercise because as soon as you start focusing on on what your like you know call to action is or what your mm-hmm. kind of um KPIs for engagement are it'll it just will lose all kind of um all kind of authenticity and um traction uh with your audience and it's very obvious when when museums or art galleries or whoever, um, when they, uh, when, when they're focusing too much on, you know, getting, selling, selling people a message of come to the, come to the organization, uh, rather than, rather than, um, focusing on engagement and storytelling. Yeah. So look, I think that's a really, um, important point. And, you know, I know you're pretty knowledgeable about what's happening um, in this space in, in the cultural sector. And are there good examples out there of museums or galleries or heritage sites that are uh, are doing this in such a way that it, it is authentic? It is, um, you know, getting a similar kind of reach to the sorts of things that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. There there are um, a number of um, of really successful cultural organisations on TikTok and they're never the ones that you expect. For example, um, for example, the Sacramento History Museum uh, in, in the United States uh, is a tiny local history museum about Sacramento. Uh, and they have, uh, I believe it's 2 million at the, at the moment. They just hit 2 million TikTok followers, which is a wow, it's crazy. phenomenal number. They have the most followers I'm, I'm out not of sure any I mean, museum. I'm not sure how many people even live in Sacramento. I'm guessing not 2 million. Exactly. Exactly. And I've, I've, um, connected with, um, Jared Jones, who is the uh, content creator for, for that account. And he's an amazing guy. He, um, yeah, he sort of just began experimenting with TikTok. He didn't sort of go in with like a very specific strategy at first, but he quickly saw what worked and what worked was him filming, uh, the 84 year old volunteer Howard in the print demons, the print, the printing press demonstration workshop at the museum and how it is the star of their TikTok account. Um, he's phenomenally popular with viewers and it's his videos that do the best on their page. So the sort of charm of, of these like lo-fi filmed on a phone videos of old Howard doing his print demonstrations have got them 2 million TikTok followers. And now they get visitors coming in to the museum who come in because of Howard and they come and buy t-shirts with his face on it and they take photos with a cardboard cutout of Howard. Uh, and it's amazing. It's this amazing story. And I really believe that there's, there's other examples like, like Sacramento 
but I really believe that um, it's these smaller um, museums or art galleries or other groups that are the most successful because they know that you can't make good TikTok content via committee. You have mm -hmm. to, you have to trust the instincts of creators, whether that's a person on your team who's really good at TikTok or who spends a lot of time on TikTok and knows how it works, or whether it's an external creator that you bring in to like advise or to make content for you or with you. Um, it's, it's the small institutions that are able to take a risk and experiment um, who aren't so concerned with their branding kind of guidelines or, or um, hitting the, the right messages. Um, and those are the ones, the ones that can take a risk and can trust, uh, can trust their instincts on the platform that, that really are very successful. And uh, I, you know, I've had experience in, in a bit of a failure of this myself. I've done a um, sponsored post for um, a big uh, art gallery uh, in Australia that was put through so many <laughs> layers of uh, so many emails. The script was shared around so many times that it got diluted to something that did not really come across as very energetically me that came across as very much a marketing pitch for come to the exhibition uh, and it flopped completely. And I really believe that if instead I had been allowed to just come in and make whatever about the exhibition, it would have done a lot better on the platform. Um, but yeah, I, I, like I said, it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a too many cooks situation occasionally. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like if you're going to work with creators, you've got to really try not to impose your own rules and frameworks that you might do in other areas of your organization. It sounds like also you've got to find your Howard. Um, and it was interesting watching those, you know, some of those uh, videos in the, the Sacramento Museum. I mean, obviously they had a great canvas, you know, amazing kind of backdrops that, you know, really worked well with something like TikTok. But I'm interested in the, uh, you know, the sort of the talent side of it, if you want to think of, of Howard like that, and whether you think uh, TikTok stars like that, whether they're they're born or are they made, um, you know, is, is it a case of just finding these authentic people or is, is there a kind of, you know, you can, is there a kind of conveyor belt? There's a way you can kind of work with people to, you know, so develop talent so somebody can, you know, uh, do the kind of things that you're doing. How, how does that side of it work? That's a great question. I think, well, like Jared from, from Sacramento History Museum told me that he thinks that every museum has a Howard somewhere. It's a volunteer or a staff member who's been there forever and knows everything inside out. Um, or it's, you know, someone on maybe like the education team who's very, he's great at talking to kids or great at giving talks. Um, and I, I, I agree with him. I think that, that most you know, every workplace has a Howard. Everyone knows a Howard somewhere. I think that you can find them, um, but activating them in a way that is successful on TikTok, that's, you know, Howard is Howard, but Howard isn't Howard without Jared. And Jared yeah. is kind of the genius behind it. And he is clearly very good at, at looking at, at, at what works, what doesn't work, at experimenting, and he, he knows how the platform works. I think when it comes to me i i don't i see myself as potentially made a little bit because my 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 producing my producer friends um were the ones who really encouraged me to to do tiktok and they gave me so much feedback very frank feedback of what worked mm. well what i was doing well and what i should stop doing or what i should do better um, and they really, really pushed me um, to to the success that I've seen. I would not; this wouldn't have happened without them. And I think that the right type of collaboration is really important. Um, I think I've learnt how to be savvy on TikTok. It wasn't innate to me, um, and it it came from putting a lot of effort and time into understanding the platform. Um, and into understanding uh, the audience 
So, and, and additionally, <laughs> when I look back on the videos that I made a year ago, my present, my presenting style is so different. I was very awkward on camera. I did not, I was not very animated. I didn't know how to sort of be engaging as a face on camera, but now I've had like a year's crash course and now I'm very comfortable, you know, presenting to a camera and being energetic and raising my voice and all of these things. Um, I think I've, you know, had to make myself, I had to make myself a Howard <laughs> over, over the past 18 months. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, we had, um, we had Dan Snow on uh, a few weeks back and, and obviously Dan is a very, you know, I'd say he's still very authentic, very personable guy, but he's obviously quite polished in that he's done years of, you know, presenting sort of mm, um, he's a great presenter. TV, you know, doc documentaries and the like for the BBC. And I'm, yeah, I'm kind, I'm kind of interested as to how that world plays out. Is, is, is Dan Snow in the next few years more likely to come through something like TikTok? you know, than necessarily the BBC. And I'm interested as to how you see that, you know, do you have any thoughts on how that media landscape's changing? Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to predict the future, but I've, I mean, I've always wanted to be, you know, someone like Dan Snow. Like I grew up watching all of the sort of BBC history documentaries. Like I love Mary Beard. I love Lucy Worsley. Mm. Um, I've always sort of wanted to be that. That's like a bit of a dream, but uh, I don't think that, that traditional part, career path into producing is going to exist in the same way in the future. I think um, uh, Dan's an interesting example because he's made his own platform. He's facilitated, mm. you know, his own um, productions uh, and that in itself is, you know, a brand new way of being a presenter and being a history communicator, um, you know, John Berger didn't really have to. Oh, I guess John Berger kind of did have to do that, but that was the seventies. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, I think the the old the the good old days of finding a um, a eloquent and well presented well presented academic from Oxbridge to present your BBC history documentary. Um, I don't think that's going to last forever. And um, the people that we see coming to the forefront of sort of presenting, whether it's sort of anywhere across like the sort of culture space, are, you know, the YouTubers of five years ago. Like there's so many like, you know, um, Vox, they hire uh, people who got huge on YouTube and that's like, and, and even TikTokers now. I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about our latest remix collaborator, the UK government, who are the series partner for See Things Differently. To celebrate this link up over the next few episodes, we're going to be exploring the stories of a number of UK based innovators. I'm also excited about this collaboration because the first ever remix summit took place in the UK in London back in 2014. 300 creatives gathered from sectors such as the arts and technology at Bloomberg's European headquarters in the heart of the city to explore the future of the creative industries, creative cities and the creative economy. Remix was designed to be a platform that would bring together creative thinkers from different industries to connect and develop new ideas. I believe that one way to spark innovation comes from the meeting of diverse minds. I think of these melting pots as the collision economy. They create an environment where you can see things differently. This collision effect is most powerful in locations where there is a large creative ecosystem and talent base in countries such as the UK. For example, did you know that the UK is ranked fourth in the world in the Global Innovation Index? There's over a hundred tech unicorns, that's companies with a valuation over a billion dollars, in the UK, which was the third country to pass this milestone. It also ranks number three in terms of venture capital investment globally. If you're interested in finding out more about doing business in the UK, then visit great.gov.uk forward slash remix to find out more. Now back to the show. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we were chatting about uh, Dan, and what was interesting, I guess, is by going down the entrepreneurial route, and as you say, building his own platform and, and, and finding a way to kind of monetize that audience, it's given him his creative freedom to um, you know, produce the historical content that he wants to produce. Now, on See Things Differently, we're really interested in the entrepreneurial side of um, culture. Um, and I guess um, thinking about that side of, of what you do, like is TikTok simply still like a hobby for you? Is it something which um, it could become a full-time job? And I'm, and I'm really interested in like the mix of, of revenue streams that kind of you know, help you to kind of get the show on the road and be able to do what you do. Yeah, well, I've, you know, I've never done TikTok as a full-time job. I don't think there are many TikTokers who are full-time TikTokers. It is different to like YouTube. You can be a full-time YouTuber if you're, you know, getting a certain number of views because YouTube has a really, um, really good uh, revenue stream for creators. TikTok has a version of this, but it is not uh, nearly anywhere near as, as profitable as as YouTube is. Um, and I've also, you know, I, at the moment I'm back to being a full-time student (laughs) for the first time in quite a few years. Um, but until recently I was still working, uh, as a video editor, um, which was my main job. But, um, I have, uh, in the past 12 months started running my content creation as a small business. Essentially, um, I get, a very small amount from Patreon, which is mm. um, really nice that there are, you know, a handful of people who want to sponsor me and that kind of covers my costs, which is great. Um, but my my actual revenue comes from my collaborations with brands and with cultural organizations. So um, all of my collaborations with art galleries uh, have been paid um, and also, um, I've also done collaboration with the um, Art History Institute of Australia, which was paid uh, to make a three-part series for TikTok for them, um, defending the study of art history. <laughs> and um, and I have an expectation um, that I will be paid for, for collaborations, uh, which um, I think that uh, is... I think I think there is a tendency to um, uh, overlook the value of content creators uh, in many industries, actually. So yeah, I think there is a tendency to overlook the value and the skill of creators. Um, what I what I do is work isn't necessarily just a fun hobby it is fun sometimes but it is also very hard work and I have a lot of um a lot of knowledge about the platform and about what I do um it's very interesting to me since moving here to the UK um I've been able to actually meet in person a lot of fellow creators that I've only ever known online before which has been amazing um and what has surprised me though is that apart from one other creator that I've met in the sort of history, art, history, culture space, apart from one other, none of my TikTok friends have ever been paid for collaborations with art galleries or museums. Um, Mm. I think that partially that could be most of them are a little bit younger than me. I'm only 25, um, but I am on the older side of the TikTok community. (laughs) Um, which is ridiculous. Um, but I think that, uh, there is a tendency to, um, want to like, you know, pay people with exposure, the classic, right. To, um, to offer, you know, these young creators who are young, who are just really excited to like be talking to an art gallery, to invite them into a space, um, for free and like, let them make content, let them have fun. But, um, but not to pay them, which is a bit mm. of a surprise to me. Um, I, I'm sure it happens in a lot of a lot of areas. I know that this happens with regular influencers all the time. Uh, and I think that it's a shame because there's so much potential in the creative industries to lead the way in investing in creators, 
because, you know, the last thing that we want is for the current generation of really amazing online creators to get burnt out and to be discouraged from doing the amazing work that they do. Uh, and the best way to like support them is to do, you know, great paid collaborations that produce amazing content and work as fantastic, you know, fantastic, um, subtle forms of marketing for whatever, you know, organization is out there that wants to collaborate. Um, great press. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I no, but I mean, if it in, 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 in YouTube and I'm sure things like, you know, TikTok, Instagram, all these areas, it's very common, obviously, for, for brands to pay for an alignment with obviously, um, and greater. So there's, there's, yeah, there's certainly nothing, um, controversial in, in, what, in what you're saying at all. And it sounds like, sounds like it's both giving huge digital exposure, um, as well as obviously also translating into, um, you know, real visits if, you know, Sacramento mm. uh, museum is, is, is anything to, to go by. So, uh, more people should be doing it more people should be paying for it. I think it probably is probably as simple as that. Um, in, in terms of that, um, entrepreneurial side of things you mentioned um patreon um and and we, we did an interview with them uh, not so long ago now and i think they've got something incredible now they've, they've raised like two billion uh dollars for creators um you know thousands and thousands of obviously creators are using that platform whether they're podcasters youtubers you know, and obviously that's about having a very direct connection to an audience and, and your community, your tribe. Um, and you talked a little bit about your connection with your, your audience earlier, but also those people being prepared to invest, you know, cold, hard dollars in in that um, relationship with you as a creator because they love what you're doing. Um, and is that an area that you see a big kind of growth in for, for you, for TikTok, um, you know, more generally as, as a big area of money? Because it seems like Patreon's going like great guns. Yeah, I mean, Patreon is just an amazing, amazing platform. Like, um, I don't, uh, I don't think there's anything else out there that that can support creators in the way that Patreon does. Um, it's quite phenomenal to me just how many people are out there who are willing to just give money to like regular small amount of money to a creator. Like, that's it's the kind of thing that if you pitched it you'd think, oh, that wouldn't work, but it does, mm. which is just phenomenal. And, um, like I said, like I, I only have a handful of, of Patreon, um, subscribers and I, um, I do, you know, really fun kind of perks with them. Like if they subscribe to a certain tier, I'll make them custom TikToks. Um, but you know, the fact that they're there just blows me away. Um, I think that, the f like, I think that Patreon's going to be around for like quite a while uh, to help support creators. I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon, um, particularly while there is a um, a bit of a gap in other types of revenue streams um, for creators. And also, I think it provides a really good option for people who creators who don't want to do commercial brand deals, um, who don't want to compromise their audience trust. The great thing about the culture sector, though, is that the types of collaborations I've done with, you know, art galleries or whatever are not the types of collaborations that are going to compromise my audience, that are going to make them think that I'm selling out. They're the types of collaborations that actually make my audience really excited. Um, so I think that, um, that Patreon is great for filling a gap when sort of the sort of commercial sector can't fill that gap in terms of creators income. But when it comes to like, you know, museums or art galleries, historic sites, um, all those kinds of places, they, they do, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Cultural institutions, um, don't read as slimy on, on social media. They read as educational, as fun, as exciting, um, so I think, I think that there's, yeah, like a really, really great opportunity for, for these organizations to, um, to sponsor creators as part of a sort of complex revenue stream. Now, look, I'm going to move into a slightly different area now. So you've, you've recently moved uh, to the UK. Uh, now, obviously the UK is known for its cultural and creative industry scene and 
I'm wondering, um, you know, has this um, shaped your your work at all? Uh, have some of these new networks that you talked about that you've built a result of this move, have they had any impact on how you're approaching things at all? It's been fantastic to meet a bunch of amazing creators overseas here where I live now in the UK because there isn't a very large community of us in Australia. <laughs> um, I only know like a handful of creators in Melbourne um, that are some really good friends of mine now. But um, yeah, it's it's really cool to meet people over here. There's there's so much more going on in the way of um, you know uh, exhibitions and yeah, I saw you festivals. popped into the the VNA. Looked like you did a yeah, kind of popped into, casually video, popped yeah. into the VNA. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is like, is really cool. Um, I think, um, it's also something that as an Australian, uh, in general, not, e not even just with my content work, but in general, um, I can't believe how, how much Europeans take for granted where they are, <laughs> how close they are to everything and how accessible everything is. It's like, it's like I'm in Disneyland at the moment. Um, <laughs> my own personal Disneyland. Um, it is interesting talking to the creators here in the UK that I've met um, about this kind of like risk management and about like the contracts that they've signed with organizations that they've done collaborations with, um, asking them like what they can and can't say. There's also like this, the glowing specter of, of colonialism everywhere, yeah. which is, you know, a very hot topic on TikTok. There are some uh, museums I would recommend should not be on TikTok because it's not a sympathetic audience to them. Um, there's some issues that are, that are, you know, not friendly to the TikTok space and to the political leanings of Gen Z on TikTok. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, I've heard some amazing stories of um, creator friends who have enacted real change in museums in Europe. I have a friend who because they made a TikTok criticizing the lack of female representation in a hall of fame at a very, very popular museum um, in Europe. Um, because of that video, two women, two women artists got added to the hall of fame. And that's Fantastic. just like the most amazing, the most amazing thing like to have. And that's the great thing about, you know, um, being situated here in the UK is like, uh, the sort of more direct lines to, um, to very kind of, you know, to the, to the, the more kind of important institutions. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you're, you're right. Also the TikTok's a two way street, isn't it? It's not just about, um, you know, broadcasting. So if, if you're going to get involved in these platforms, you've got to be like any form of social media, you've got to be prepared to be part of a conversation. Um, uh, you know, and you're not in, you're not, you're not necessarily leading that, that conversation. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that, that's kind of fascinating, but it's great to see that there's some um, positive outcomes happening as, 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 a, as a result of that. Look, we're, we're sort of starting to, to wrap up now. Um, you know, I was fascinated when you were talking about, um, you know, some of the earlier examples like uh, in Sacramento and are there any other uh, people, uh, organizations that excite you on, uh, TikTok that, uh, you know, particularly in the culture space that you might want to mention. Yeah. I wrote a list. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a, you know, TikTok groupie. I, I, I'm such a fan of so many different creators. Um, I first like, like want to give a shout out to like two really great creators from Melbourne, my friends, um, Julian O'Shea, who does fantastic, uh, work, uh, on urban infrastructure and telling the stories of, of Melbourne, uh, on TikTok. He's also a really good YouTuber as well. Uh, and Esme James, who has a series on TikTok called Kinky History, where she talks about the history of human sexuality, um, which is, you know, like a pretty saucy topic that they don't teach you in school. I think that's, that's sort of the main, <laughs> the main cause of her success is like, it's like, you know, fascination we all have with sex. Um, she um she's doing phenomenally well on TikTok and she's just been funded by Screen Australia to to make um a series uh, about statistics and um and sexual history in Australia. I also um there's a few like really interesting creators on TikTok that um 
have really interesting links to sort of media groups. For example, there's Cleo Abram, who works for Vox, and she makes fantastic TikTok content. I'm not sure if it's part of her portfolio at Vox or whether it's more of a, you know, independent work, but um, she's doing a great series at the moment on um, uh, women in STEM who've sort of been forgotten by history. It's called Page Not Found. And she has a great presentation style that works really well across YouTube, um, across Vox, where she writes, and on TikTok. Um, it's also... Um, a really fascinating account on TikTok called Planet Money, which is the TikTok account for a podcast that uh, is owned by, um, I believe it's the, is it PBS? Is that the public broadcast Yeah, I know, I know the, the one United you mean. States? It's something like PBS. Yeah, well, they have a TikTok account and the people who make those TikToks are geniuses. <laughs> Their TikToks are these bizarre, lo-fi, but highly edited um, meme-like explainers about finance, about money, about um, financial systems. And they have this, this one guy who hosts them who's this kind of awkward deadpan presenter <laughs> But they're just brilliant and they're so successful on the platform. I don't think anyone knows that they're run by PBS. Like it doesn't, they kind of fly under the radar. I don't think people even know that they're a podcast, but they're making this fantastic content that's getting millions of views. Um, wow, how and interesting. really like they clearly have maybe, a ha you know, a team of two or three people who are like, you know, geniuses at TikTok. And it's just, it's just fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, we, we will put links to all of those in the show <laughs> notes. So that's, that, that's great. Um, yeah, lots, lots more to kind of dig into. Um, so last couple of questions, really. Um, well, f first of all, look, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this going, um, yep, yeah, this, this sounds like something I might want to get into. And hopefully they are um, thinking that as a result of this, whether it's a cultural institution, whether it's an, an individual uh, creator. And look, what, if you had to give them like one piece of advice, you know, for, for someone who wanted to get started on TikTok, what would it be? Um, I think it would be to make a lot of content. Uh, that's like, I think, I think the thing that has made my content better is just the sheer quantity that I made. I know this sounds insane. I was in lockdown at the time, but I made three videos a day for about a month and a half, maybe two months, which is Yeah, that's pretty hard. Many. <laughs> that's too many. I think we can acknowledge that it's too many. <laughs> but um I think because I made so much so frequently, it got better very fast. <laughs> yeah. And it got um, it, it and does got, the algorithm um, love that as well? Does it love obviously frequent posting? It's very hard to tell anything for certain about the TikTok algorithm, but it does appear that it prefers regular frequent posting and the more frequent, the better in some ways. You don't want to spam it, but you know, the more frequent, the better. Could it be good? Um, Could it be good frequent? About, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the good thing about TikTok is that you can make, you can make your videos in app you don't have to, you know, use a camera. You don't have to have microphones. Um, it's very mm. easy. So making three videos a day, while it sounds crazy, you know, a lot of it was just me talking to my phone for a few seconds. So <laughs> the more that you make... So lo so lo-fi is totally fine in that sense. Absolutely. You know? It's actually probably better. I think that the videos that I've put more production value into do not necessarily do any better than the videos that I film in, you know, two minutes on my phone using the TikTok effects. Um, it's, it's, it's all about, it's all about the style. It's all about the aesthetic of TikTok coming through on your videos. Um, and I think that the more you make and the less precious you are about it, and the more you think about the important things, which is your script, what you're saying, how you're captivating the audience, um, the more you focus on those things and just keep trying the the better your content will be and the better your account will do. 
Yeah, oh, that's fun. that's fantastic. That's great advice. Look, it just remains for me to say, look, is there anything else that you think we've missed you would like to cover? I think I'd just like to, you know, reiterate that um, there's so much opportunity uh, in the culture space for investment in creators. And I know, obviously, I would say this because I am a creator <laughs> and I want to be invested in, but... But, um, so, you know, I speak, I speak on, you know, on behalf of, you know, all my creative friends when we say that, you know, we want to collaborate, we want to make great stuff. We want to talk about, you know, things in your museum collection or your festival or whatever it is you're doing. We want to talk about it. We want to share it. Um, and we know how to do it well. And, and when it comes to, you know, new spaces like TikTok, um, you know, don't underestimate uh, how how difficult it is to and, and the skill that it requires to um, to know how the platform works and to be successful on the platform. Uh, and we're here and we're ready to we're ready to work. Well, look, that's a pretty good call to arms, and hopefully, there's a curator or two uh, listening um, to this, and uh, that phone will ring um, uh, before too long. <laughs> so, look. Uh, look, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the uh, the podcast, Mary. It's been um, yeah, just so, so insightful, and um, yeah, thanks once again. Thanks so much. So thanks for staying with us, and that's a wrap for this episode. Another great guest will follow in our next edition. I'm Peter Tullen, and if you like what you hear, there are literally hundreds more talks from Remix events all around the globe at remixsummits.com and as mentioned many of them are free if you want to support remix then you can subscribe to access all of our latest and upcoming talks from remix events and if you're in australia our next remix summit takes place in sydney on the 8th to 9th of march thanks for joining us